So just another <laughs> illustration of, of internationalization. And uh, it will, it's a kind of a support to what I've said already when, when you open for a competition uh, and uh, you have one country with a kind of a thin cluster, what could happen? So <coughs> when, when we consider this, we have a point of departure, it's a high barrier to trade. Two companies, both are serving their domestic markets. Uh, so we have a two, two model, two countries, two companies. In the second step, <coughs> the barriers to trade are f further reduced, or step one, I forgot step one, where you remove some of the resistance towards trade, you open for competition, the monopoly power of each firm is weakened, profits are reduced. Uh, so this is, uh, at the outset, a story about countries, but it could also be a story about regions, a competition between regions. Step two, we reduce the uh, barriers to trade even further, <coughs> and, uh, and we have a kind of a very strong competition. And uh, when you have a strong competition, the competition can hardly be further increased if it is strong already. That is what is meant by the term, the sentence, the competitive pressure is stabilized. It is stabilized on a high level. And <coughs> if we, let's say, assume a free flow of uh, of uh, a free trade flow, not much uh, of barriers. You have still a strong competition. Um, focus on on uh, on cost advantages because of uh, increased, let's say, improvement in processes and products, and the profitability is increasing because of cost reductions and increased and product variety, so you sort of improve the quality and the diversity of, of the production uh, and you are becoming very, these two companies are becoming very cost efficient. This step three, it's very hard for me to say, agree upon entirely because it is so dependent, whether that will happen is so dependent upon the balance between the trade partners in the first place. And it also, it's also, it rests upon the assumption that uh, the resource base, let's say the workforce in both, uh, both countries or regions are, uh, are uh, let's say, balanced, that the, the labor costs are fairly equal and so on and so forth. So for the, <coughs> For the um, course in, in transportation and localization, you should just think back to what I said about Myrdal's cumulative causation theory and the importance of uh, balance between trade partners. And if you have a weak industry cluster competing with a strong, or uh, a company from a weak industry cluster competing with a company from a strong industry cluster, industry cluster in another country, then the balance is perhaps not there and you may get, uh, <coughs> you may get bankruptcies and you may get, uh, uh, let's say, um, what we may call industry shedding, that, uh, that companies go bankrupt or they choose to move to, to, to another place. So this illustration is uh, showing what I, uh, what I have said. This is profitability. This is size of trade barriers, which is uh, in this direction, they are diminishing. And uh, <coughs> up to this, this point, you have increased competition uh, and the costs are diminishing because of uh, the reduced barriers to trade and the increased competition. These are <laughs> returns on uh, alternative investments. And when you have, when, when the return 
on uh, invested capital in a company goes below this line here, you get uh, the potential of, uh, of bankruptcies. And then the trade, what I will call the trade liberalists, they firmly believe that strong competition will in due course cause uh, high profitability because everything connected to product development and uh, external effects and so on uh, gives higher return on invested capital. I think this, uh, this movement perhaps to an area like, like the, uh, to, to a point like this is, is kind of justifiable as a consequence of international trade, but it is not easy to see this taking place. That you get a, a very a significant increase in profitability as a necessary consequence of, uh, of full trade liberalization. It may be that that will take place, but it is, uh, but it needs some strong assumptions connected to uh, to uh, size and balance between uh, trade partners. If you have a small and a big player, you can feel pretty sure that the small player will will uh, perhaps uh, lose out, either move, be uh, be bought by the big uh, big player, or go bankrupt. And in that case, you may end up with, uh, with uh, even more concentration as a consequence of, uh, of trade liberalization. As I showed you on the, on the map of Europe, with, ma with many small clusters replaced by big, few bigger clusters, is a... Uh, is, um, can be explained by, by an illustration like this. Where in some regions you may have uh, a good profitability because of concentration, but uh, in other regions you may have a downturn of uh, economic activities because of, uh, of uh, this industry shredding and uh, concentration. Yes, so <coughs> internationalization for a, for a small open economy uh, can then, uh, it's, it's quite open, how, what, what, what might happen. Um, but if we are moving below this critical mass point B, if companies start to, to move to other, other countries, you have the, <laughs> the external effects with a negative sign if the size of the economic system diminishes, costs increases, competition may be weakened, and so on. So the whole economic system may, may contract, may be reduced. And uh, then you get this cell phone case from, uh, from Oslo in the 1980s. Or the shipbuilding industry in, uh, in, uh, in Central Eastern Norway in the 80s and the beginning of the 90s, where you, have, you had quite a lot of big shipyards around the Oslo Fjord, which is now gone, there is nothing left, because of, uh, well, there were many, many explanations for that, but one of them was, uh, was increased, increased competition and too high costs and uh, so on. Then on to some examples. <coughs> this, is, uh, this is a map of, uh, of, of the US taken from Porter, and you will see some of the, these are clusters of various sizes. You'll find this, uh, this um, carpet cluster here. We'll have Silicon Valley here, the information and communication technology. Uh, lots of uh, different sectors. You have a vine cluster somewhere in, uh, in California, I don't think it's on this map. But there are, uh, these are 
places which are fulfilling the let's say the demands for how a cluster should be defined in uh, in the in line with Porter. Then. This is an example of uh, of the vine cluster in California, where you see the different uh, activities that is uh, part of this. Here you have the the suppliers of uh, different types of uh, of input: the grape stock, fertilizers, harvesting equipment watering irrigation technology and, and, and so on, which is then uh, parts of the, of the agricultural cluster. On this side we have classical uh, supplies like barrels, bottles and so on, which is primary needs for the, for the production of wine. And then the, the core industries or the, or the focal firms here. And then you have education and you have public support and everything in place. So if you're going to, let's say, study a specific type of industry, then to be able to define whether this is a cluster or not, you need to do this kind of mapping to see how, how things are and also to try to work out whether they, whether they, they actually are collaborating, competing, sharing knowledge, uh, also between all these different uh, parties. This is the maritime cluster. <coughs> um, another way of illustrating uh, this, uh, this shipbuilding cluster in, in this region. And here you have uh, a wider, let's say, array of uh, players that are presented. You have all these Brokers, banking, maritime lawyers, insurance, R&D, consultants. And on the, uh, on the right hand side you have the shipyards, boat builders, ship equipment and so on. In this case, the shipping industry is the focal company. In, uh, in the previous illustration that I showed you on this uh, shipbuilding cluster, the let's say the shipyards was the focal firms. But you see here that <coughs> these two uh, boxes are kind of showing the demanding customers in this, uh, in this industry. Uh, companies that are putting a strong and very quite sophisticated demand pressure on this industry. And the shipping industry in, in, uh, at large are then, they have to serve this and then they have to, to develop equipment and so on to, to support the needs of these customers. So the customers are the driving force here as you learn from a let's say, a, a basic course in supply chain management. You, you are trying to, to have a keen, eye on, a keen eye on the end customer needs. But the picture there, if you dig into it, is quite diverse when it comes to the importance of the end customer needs. And in the cluster sense, the conditions for the end customer needs to be of very high importance is that they can also uh, improve the competitive power of these, uh, these core industries. Like for instance, serving local needs can also serve global needs and hence increase the, the demand for the, for the products. We can uh, also take this uh, a bit further, try to map the, the, the cash flow in, the, in, a, in a cluster like this. This is the maritime cluster in this, this county. The year is 2006. 
And they counted the number of uh, shipping companies, number of shipyards, number of suppliers. 140 firms as suppliers, quite a lot. 12 shipyards is enough to have uh, what we might call a good competitive environment. You have the shipping companies who are and the deep ship fishing companies who are the, 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 demanding, the demanding customers here. We could also have added the oil and gas industry. It's not a part of this illustration, but they could have been because they are an important customer here. And we see the, <coughs> the turnover of the shipyards. It's around 10 billion Norwegian kroner back in 2006. So it's, it's a way of describing the, the, the cash flow. I will expand a bit upon this by, by showing you this one. Because this shows the, the flows where the shipyards, <coughs> they are the 42% of the turnover goes to shipping companies that are uh, located in this region. And the remaining, if you add these two together, you get 58% uh, is then of the products are then sold to other Norwegian shipping companies outside of this region. And 26%, one quarter of the, of the turnover of the shipyards is then exported to international companies. So this shows, let's say, the the logic of, let's say, being in a, in, a, in a system where the products that you develop is also attractive for, uh, for foreign, foreign customers. And one quarter amounts to 2.2 billion Norwegian kroner in this, uh, in this case. And then we can describe the equipment suppliers where 38% of the locally based equipment suppliers goes to the shipyards. Uh, and then 40% goes to export. Again, underlining, underlining the, it's, it's, uh, and it says something about the importance of that the local demand can also make the equipment suppliers attractive for, for exports. And quite a lot of this is actually uh, exports to, uh, to the other side of the pond, to, to Brazil. And also, some, of course, something to the, goes, to the, goes to the Far East. So it's a way of illustrating the flow of, uh, of economic value in, in a cluster. And it fits, it's, this is done to try to see whether the, the Porter's theory is actually, we can say that it makes sense. And I think, uh, I think the, this, is, this is quite interesting to try to map how, how the distribution of, uh, of activities between exports, imports, local, global, uh, who is, uh, who is um, uh, how is the supplying industry? How do they work? Do they work only with the local uh, companies or do they also work with exports? Says something about whether you stand on one leg or whether you are diversified in your, uh, in your, when it comes to your, uh, your market. Seems that the equipment suppliers are quite diversified here. They are not only dependent on the local industry. The local industry <coughs> is not only dependent on the local shipping companies, and so on. So it also says something about robustness in a cluster like this. This is, uh, this is an illustration of relationships between players where you have, uh, this is on a scale from one to seven, 
where seven is a, a, an import, a, a relationship of a very high importance. And we see that uh, <coughs> perhaps the strongest relationships is between the ship design consultants, the shipyards, and the ship owners. And that has to do with this, this uh, type of cooperation that I started out with, that they engage in, uh, in the product development. So this is, a, let's say, a very strong triangle. And the equipment suppliers are more, let's say, they are also a part of this, but the strongest relationship is, is between the, these designers and the, the customers. And, the, and in this case, the, the focal firms, which are the shipyards in this, uh, in this cluster. And then you can start to ask, if you do a kind of study like this, and you find that uh, the strength of the cooperation here is not too strong, and also here it's, it's 3.2, it's uh, some somewhere in the middle, three to four. Why is this the case? And this is the potential here for improving these relationships. And what good would that make? That is kind of elaborating further on this, uh, on, the, on an approach like this. Industry cluster and transportation. I'll wind up this lecture with, uh, with this. Um, goes without saying, this is important as other trade barriers are reduced between countries, between regions, transport costs become more, more important. Then they constitute a larger part of the costs connected to the movements. The long run profitability of transport investments, if you are going to assess the profitability of investments, they are likely to be higher in areas with industry clusters because of this return on invested capital, which is a proxy for productivity. So the, let's say, the value of saving travel time is likely to be, be higher in areas with, uh, with, uh, with stronger industry clusters because of this, uh, this higher return on, uh, on invested capital, which is not taken into account in today's cost-benefit analysis practice. CBA stands for cost-benefit analysis practice. How big the differences are, it's an, it's an open question. And then for some of you, I have to re just then refer to the previous lecture on wider economic impacts that, I, that we had last, last week. Uh, There are, I, I would say that the focus when we talk about the need for more, let's say, better transport systems and in relationship with industry clusters has to be here as in all other, uh, let's say, circumstances. It's re related to the existence of bottlenecks. So, uh, and uh, <coughs> there may be, there are cases of, uh, of uh, let's say, when you relieve or remove bottlenecks, that, uh, that things may start to happen in terms of uh, economic activities across borders between regions. Like, for instance, the connections between Sweden and Denmark, which uh, I was asked in, when I defended my, uh, my PhD thesis in, back in 2001, I was asked whether I would believe that the effects of the Resund link between Sweden and Denmark, which, which was just opened at the time, whether it would be uh, immediate effects of that. And I said, no, I don't believe that. But we should wait perhaps 15 years to see what will happen. And now things are starting to happen in terms of interaction. So, uh, 
In supporting industry clusters, transport infrastructure has a, has a function as being a generic uh, means for reducing uh, friction and increasing the size of the labor market and, and things like that. And in, in that sense, industry clusters are not treated any different from other, uh, other types of, uh, let's say, or, or other areas where transport investments are considered. But um, the only thing is that one should perhaps pay close attention to uh, to the benefits in terms of, uh, uh, in the sense that transport infrastructure investments may have larger productivity effects in areas with industry clusters as compared to other areas. Which we are actually doing research on at the moment and there are a few answers to be given to that question. Okay, then I will stop. If you are confused, we, I hope you are confused at a higher level than before. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>